Hello, my name is Philip Riken. I am the president of Wheaton College. I am not an expert on the biblical languages, but I have studied them and I am a return guest on Exegetically Speaking. Dr. Philip Riken, Dr. Riken, President Riken, good to see you. Welcome yeah, back. Nice to see you again, David. Thank you so much for doing these podcasts. I, I love the fact that people are listening to them and getting a deeper interest in studying the Bible in its original languages. Well, that that's, I wouldn't say a dying art, but there are people that would like for it to die off, it seems like, but we're not going to well, let it die. No, and, and I think to some degree, seminaries in some cases have minimized a bit those biblical language requirements. It's mm-hmm. hard to get everything in that you want to get in. Right. But we think at Wheaton College, and I know so many other people in biblical studies believe, it's really important to have that foundation in the biblical languages. It is. And and people use it in, th- in theology and archaeology and lots of uh, church history, church history, a lot of other sort of disciplines associated, not necessarily just biblical studies, right? To say nothing of pastoral ministry. That's right. Pastoral ministry. Yeah. Let's make sure that, that yeah, we get to that. Now, today we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 5. And that's in the Hebrew part of the Bible, right, for those. And so you've had to study some Hebrew along the way, and you're in your theology as well. But there's, uh, what, what's, tell us what's happening here in Ecclesiastes Yeah, well, Ecclesiastes five. is a great book. It and, is. It's wonderful. Um, My I, rabbi friend says it's his favorite book. You know, for a lot of people, it's their favorite book. I say it's the only book of the Bible we know was written on a Monday morning when somebody <laughs> was discouraged. Probably a philosophy major wrote yeah, it as well. Yeah. Uh, the Solomon of Ecclesiastes uh, could well have been Solomon himself, and it's it, certainly the book is styled as as authored by uh, by mm-hmm. Solomon, and um, it takes a really sober look at the hard questions people have about meaning in life. Everybody's looking for the meaning of life in one sense or another, mm-hmm. and um, Ecclesiastes starts with an experiment. You know, maybe the answer is to be found in. Money, that's one of them. And mm-hmm. that, that theme is back here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And what the philosopher theologian that wrote Ecclesiastes found in so many ways is that earthly things looked only at from an earthly perspective ultimately fail to satisfy and to bring that sense of meaning. So mm-hmm. that's why people think of Ecclesiastes as kind of a discouraging book because it's a sober look at life. What I love about Ecclesiastes is the ultimately God-honoring perspective and some of the joy and meaning that does come when you see things from God's point of view. I think that's ultimately the point of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, it's it's a it's a marvelous book. And and it's one of those books where in in at least in the opening chapters there's some hard things to translate it from the standpoint of the Hebrew. Yeah, no, that that's definitely true. That, and that is somewhat true of the verses I want to read for us okay. um, from chapter 5. Um, it's, it's a warning for us. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has the owner but to see them with his eyes. So just mm. even it's hard to understand even in English, let right. alone in Hebrew. Exactly. One, one key word here, which it's not our focus, but it's this word vanity, um, a word for things that are earthly, that are empty, that are vaporous, translated mm-hmm. in different ways. Vanity, not in the sense of pridefulness, right. but vanity in the sense of something that's empty and ultimately fails to satisfy. So, and, and fleeting. And, and fleeting. And, right? Yes. I mean, you know, what, what satisfies one day is not going to satisfy the next. Particularly if you know you're going to die at the end of it all, which is also a perspective that uh, Ecclesiastes brings in again Good. and again. Yeah. What I, what I wanted to just comment on, David, um, is, is verse 11 here. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. Hmm. I long ago realized when I was in seminary, you know, if you look at the exegetical commentaries, very gifted people have really studied the scriptures in depth. For most of us, with very few exceptions, we're not going to come up with a brand new exegetical insight uh, that nobody's ever thought of before. And I would also say most of the time, it's not as if the original languages, in this case, biblical Hebrew, 
are a kind of secret code that opens up a meaning that's inaccessible to anyone else. Right, exactly. Most of the time, our translations really do a good job of, of getting the meaning of the passage. But oftentimes, we've got a question, or we, we want to know something for sure, or we want to just get a feel for how, how is that expressed in the biblical world, in the biblical context? Mm-hmm. What I notice in this verse is a repetition of the word increase. When goods increase, something else increases. They increase who, I've got the English Standard Version in front of me. It says, eat them, maybe consume them that is, maybe, a better, yeah. is a better translation mm-hmm. for us. Because it's not necessarily, it's not like some monster is going to come and actually <laughs> eat up all your possessions. Yeah. But they will be um, consumed. And, and some of the sources of consumption are specified in Ecclesiastes. The government might take them away. You're going to lose them all when you die anyway. That, that's certainly an Ecclesiastes certainly, perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, you may be susceptible to theft. Like wealth is really uncertain in this life. Mm-hmm. And and that's a perspective here in Ecclesiastes. The question I had when I read this in English translation is, oh, there seems to be a turn of phrase there. The goods increase and something else increases. It's the people that that take those goods away. Mm-hmm. And I was just wondering, is that the same word or not? Like, you, you have to be able to look at the original languages to get that kind of information. Because in it case, is in English in this translation. Yes. So, and I like that in an English translation when it's kind of reflecting as much as it can the the vocabulary range of, of the of the original language. But in this case, it's a Hebrew um, Hebrew verb, rabah, which is it's not a particularly complex or um, noteworthy term. It, it simply means to increase. It can be used in all kinds of contexts. But I think it does show us here, the author is putting a little turn of phrase to show the irony. Mm-hmm. Because, and the irony is heightened by the fact that the word is repeated. So it's exciting. Your wealth is increasing. That's exactly what you want. Isn't that great? Unfortunately, something else is increasing, which is all the things that take that money away. The the government, the expenditures that you have. Your relatives. Your relatives, (laughs) perhaps. Yeah, exactly. uh, There's an irony here, and, and it's an important, just a spiritual point for us. In a, in a culture that is highly susceptible to a virus, some have described as affluenza, where you just want mm-hmm. a little bit more and want to be a little more affluent, just realize, yes, you may be upwardly mobile, but there are lots of things that take away that money. It's just not a solid foundation. It's not what we should be pursuing in life. That's the point that the author is making. And he's using his words to heighten our sense of the irony to drive the point home. There's an artistry here that I, I think that comes through in English, and we can confirm it in the original Hebrew. That's a great reading, Dr. Reichen, of this text. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. You know, it's always great to speak to the president of Wheaton College, Dr. Phil Reich, and I appreciate him making himself available. College presidents are extremely busy. It's hard to get on their calendar, so thank you, Dr. Reich. Um, he's always insightful. He, he's very, you know, humble about what he knows, but he knows a lot more than he lets on. I guarantee you that. You can tell that in his preaching and his writing. Listen, study at Wheaton College. Study under that president and all the good people at Wheaton College who are teaching biblical languages. Uh, you can do a master's. You can do an undergraduate degree, but just go to wheaton.edu and get started today. Listen, it's great to be with you. I'm David Caves from the Near Theological Library in Houston, Texas. Come see us. Thanks for listening.